both single rotors, so a lot of things are the same between this machine and that machine there. So we were talking about pinch point, so we've got the same thing in this fella here. We're talking about sieve loading, sift, same thing here, uh, repeat, same thing. So everything is the same roughly about between the two machines there. Um, if we start on the front here, um, over the last few years, I've done a lot of work on these machines when it comes to feeding and grain loss. So around this area here, we've seen an issue with our, if we start off on the fronts, on our feeding on the Draper front. So John Deere comes out with a 16 inch drum. We couldn't get the big bulky stuff through the 16 inch drum. We found a 14 inch drum that we can put in. So that gained us another half a K or one and a half K an hour. Um, that wasn't good enough. And then we found the primary sales turbo drum. So we started putting that in and that sorted our, our issue on the feeding on the fronts. So that's one thing that we can do. Um, as Daniel mentioned before, the second thing that we started finding was our um, feed accelerator belt kept on burning and the clutch on the feed house was going off all the time. So why is that? Um, we can't get the material out of our feed house into our rotor area quick enough. So what we've done is we've we found this tough crop feed accelerator kit that we can put on it. So you can put it on any machine if you buy it through spare parts. You can also order it through a new machine if you sit down an auto machine, you can pick the tough crop feed accelerator to put it in. So um, I'm not sure what this machine has got in it, um, but normally if you get the normal feed accelerator, you've got three feed accelerator plates per run on the feed accelerator. On the tough crop one, there's six feed accelerator plates, so it makes it more aggressive, and the gap between the bottom of that and the floor is bigger. So more material will go in, so your feed, your machine heaps better. Um, then we come into our concave area here. Brett said you can adjust the concave cage on the red machines. We can't adjust it on these ones here. So we can't shift the pinch point, but our pinch point is already sitting where Brett is adjusting it towards. So I think it's seven of these bars down. If you do the concave leveling, that's where it will start eating. He said about the forwards, uh, the parallel between the machines. So I've drawn here a little, a little diagram. I'll try to take it off later. So that's the top of our cage. So if I get my lever here, that's that one there. Then we've got our rotor. So those two there will be parallel to each other. And then we've got our concaves here at the bottom. So one, two, and three, number one, two, and three. So what happens when the rotor and the concaves aren't parallel to each other? So it can go either way, either it can sit up at the back or it can sit down at the back. So we've got a small gap here, a big gap there. So we're talking about pinch point all the time. We want these, this gap here between number one, two and three concave to be level and that's where Brett added its little gauge for the 81 mils. So on these things here, exactly the same. Grain loss, a very big issue if this is not parallel with a grain loss at the back of the machine. So there's procedures that we do it um, through the operator's manual. Obviously, this is an active concave, so it's operated hydraulically. Um, with the non-active concaves, you've still got a little wiper motor here on the side that you adjust it electronically. So, so for instance, you've got your rotors or your concave set at 10, and it's not level. Where's the 10 at? Is the 10 in the center, or is the 10 at the front, or is the 10 at the back? So say for instance, you've got it at 10, it might be five at the front, 10 in the center, and 15 mil at the back. So where you really want to thresh it, it could be just half a, half a concave that you're actually doing the work. So there's a lot of grain that will go towards the back that's not actually threshed and out of the head. So very important to do that. Um, we can't shift it from left to right, so we don't need to worry about the pinch point. It, it is what it is. Uh, but the parallel, we need to do that. Um, concaves, there's a thousand different concaves out on the market. And everyone reckons that, yep, if you put in our concave, we're going to stop rotor loss. So everyone knows about the John Deere's with rotor loss. So that's why the, the concave manufacturers have come up and say, if you use our concave, you're going to stop rotor loss. Uh, the Condax concaves, that's the ones that we're going to test this year. 
We get a lot of questions where the convex concave, what works and what doesn't work. Looking at the convex concave, it looks like it will work because it's got small openings and it's got bars that's sitting on a 45 degree angle around the concave. So what I'm preaching is these little bars here. So that goes onto a 31 wire concave, which is the one at the front. So that's the interrupter bar. So you pull all the, take the concave out, pull all the wires out of it, put this interrupter bar in it, and then you stick the wires back in. I don't make these things, so I just used it. So the price through John Deere is pretty expensive on these ones, about 280 bucks for these bars. Um, you can't just use one or two or three, I would say minimum eight to 10 of these bars that you put into your concave. As the material is coming through into our machine, this bar here, and this is, uh, the same with these ones here, that is actually where the material will be hitting against. So that's where all the action will happen. The wires that's in the concave, that just keeps all the material up there, right? So this one here is where the action happens. This is where the threshing happens. So say for instance, you take your number one concave out and you put, you fill it up with these bars. I think you put about 22 of them in, if you can fill it up. What effectively are you doing with your number one concave? So by putting these bars in, you're doubling the area of your number one concave. So if you fill your number one concave up with these ones, you effectively put two concaves into one, because this is where, it, where it's hitting. So logic tells us when we're thinking about it, we want to get that material out, out of our concave area onto our surf area as soon as what we can. What did Brett say before? We want to keep all the mock, all the material other than grain, we want to keep in that cage there and piss it off. So we don't need to deal with it on our sieves. So the bigger gap we've got here, the more material will fall out onto our sieves. The harder the sieves need to work, the harder our repeats need to work, right? So we need to, to thrash it as hard as what we can in here. And when we get to the back, we'll talk about that in a second, but we need to thrash it as hard as what we can in there. Now, I'll get Brett to come in and have a chat about this one. Um, on the class eights and nines machines, we've got nine extra spots on the router to put nine extra elements onto it, right? So that is something that we do on Lucent. We put nine extra elements in. So last year, Brett had a chat the first time that we were doing these schools, and he told me to get in there with a grinder and cut some of our router elements off, the back part of it, the backbone. And I almost fell off my chair and I thought, what the hell is this bloke on about? So when we were traveling through WA the other day, I had a customer who said to me, who asked me whether I've done that. And I said, no, I haven't. And he said, well, it's a great thing to do. We cut our grain loss back. Why do we cut our grain loss back? We do more work in this area here. We get the grain out of the heads quicker. The quicker we get it out, the quicker the separation starts. Right, so do you want to explain the part of the backbone onto the rotor element? So on the, on the standard John Deere element, they have five rasps and the back one continues and cuts across the back like a, a breaker element, okay? That breaker is actually for corn cobs. That's what it's for. It doesn't serve any purpose in cereals. Um, if you buy cereal elements, they don't have that on there. Okay, so what we had been doing was changing them and putting serial elements on them. Okay, so last year we had been talking about it, well actually two years, two harvests ago, I did a machine at Franklin, so down in the cold and damp and 10 ton crop areas, um, these guys grow pretty good crops. And one of the things that we discovered was when we first started harvesting, that um, we put a terminator on the back of the machine and, and we just kept blocking it, kept blocking the infeed into the chopper. And when we started pulling the thing apart and trying to unblock the header, which anyone who's ever done it knows it's a nightmare, um, we discovered basketball sized balls of material. So we pulled all of the cage grates out, pulled all the concaves out, and tried to track back what was happening. So in canola, stalky, gangly canola with a bit of green material in it, the material comes up the rotor, goes around, 
And because of the shape, I need a rasp bar really, because of the shape of the rasp bar, as, it, as it's coming over the concave, the concave interrupter bar is grabbing the material and slowing it and it's rolling. And it's rolling like this across the face of the rasp bar. Okay? And what that does is it creates a rope. Yeah? Then we get to our separation area and you've got your pegs on the rotor. They'll come through and cut that rolled up knotted rope into these bits and spin it the other way. Yep, so you're all following where I'm going. And then they go under the beater, it squashes them and they go pop and they won't fit between the divider baffle and the back wall of the chopper. Okay, as soon as they don't fit through there, you've turned your harvester into a hay baler. So we started looking at that and I just said to Simon, I wonder what would happen if we put additional elements on the rotor. So I did a bit of research and I discovered that if you buy one of these machines and you want to harvest rice, here we go again, talking about rice, what do you reckon they do to the rotor? They load it up. So they actually do what they call dense packer. So when you go and do all of the research, the John Deere research, there are three different variations of dense packing. So two of them have just angles or little angle pieces and little brackets. And the third variant, which is the rice variant, has a double up of the small grain rasp bar. So we got his old John Deere bars that we'd taken off got to them with an angle grinder and removed the back rib so that it still looks like a rasp, but it's missing the back rib. Put them on and we went harvesting. Three things happened. One, no more lumps and bumps. The thing was quiet. You know, you can hear that active concave banging and clanging away with big lumps of canola. Doesn't do it anymore. So that was the first thing. The second thing was, even when it was raining, and I mean, literally, we had four hectares to go and we just kept picking the windrows up. We kept harvesting that stuff in the rain and it never blocked the header. Okay? And to this date, he has never blocked that header. He said, I block it every year. I used to block it in canola before we even put the Terminator on it at least two or three times a season. He said, it's never blocked since. Okay? Aaron Candeloro last year, before the start of harvest, we were talking about it, he put two sets of modified RAS bars on his S680. Different header, 45 tonne an hour, no road loss. Runs out of horsepower. Okay, so what else did I do? I went and got a couple of sets of small grain RAS bars and I put them on one header out of two out at Mount Walker that both have seed terminators on. So you get different opinions because there's two boys and a dad who drive this, right? And they move between the headers. All three of them hate driving the standard header. That's the first thing that comes out. The second thing is, the one that's modified, is about 30% more capacity than the standard header. Third thing, when we talked about all this sieve loading stuff and a lot of what we're driving is about sieve loading, both those machines run seed terminators. The one that's got the modified header on the front of the terminator has never had a belt on the terminator. And we put four sets of belts under the other terminator just from mill loading alone. Okay, so, so we've changed everything about the loading. And all we did was small grain rasp bars and dense pack that rotor. It's a bog stock header every other way. So am I saying it is gonna work? I don't know the only way you're going to know. My friend, you need to try it. But all I know is a revelation. And while we're talking about that, old New Hollands, that's what we do to their rotor. There's additional rasp bar positions, we bolt them on. And any machine I find that's got additional rasp bar positioning, I'm going to go and bolt it on and I'm going to give it a crack. Because what I've found is the more iron you put on your rotor, the more times it goes over your concave, the more separation you get. And that's the theory between the on the dense back. Correct. Yeah. Right. And because you've got all that extra iron in there, you open the concave. And because you can open your concave, you don't belt your straw up. 
because you don't belt your straw up, it separates easier. So the whole system works easier. And like I say, you know, from Franklin to 2J to Mount Walker, so the three completely different environments in Western Australia. And it's worked in all three cases. And Candeloros, Aaron drove his 680 alongside X9. And he said, I'm not buying an X9. I said, why is that? And he said, I'm within 10% of what that thing will do. Okay, so that was his perspective of that. So, in the same crop condition, same paddock. So, you know, you can drastically change what your machine does just by having to mess around. For 1500 bucks worth of iron, I reckon give it a crack. We can give it a go. Yeah, yeah. if you can buy the bars. If you've got some coming in there. So I got Brad to talk about the, the cutting it off. It's a test that I haven't done before. Um, so I've got the nine rasp bars or nine sets of rasp bars coming that I will put on a 780 or 790. We'll do the drop test first, uh, just as the machine is sitting here. We'll, we'll put the nine rasp bars on it or nine sets and we'll do another drop test and see whether we can find a result on that. So hopefully we can get some good results out of that. Um, two weeks ago, we were up in Queensland and we told a customer exactly that, cut the backbone of your rotor elements off. I had a phone call from him last week saying he's, he's got two 780s. He's done it on one. Um, he hasn't done it on the other one. And he called me back and he said, are they putting more tons per hour through the machine? The yield is better and the fuel, loss, fuel consumption is less. So they're going to get the second machine into the shed and do the same thing. And he was a little bit worried. He called me and said, are you sure about all these changes? So he's done it to one machine, not the other, and the results were better. Um, thinking about that, on the 50 series harvesters that we had that came out 22 years ago, their rotor elements didn't have that backbone on it. And if you talk to the old customers who used to have them, they would say to you, my grain loss was a lot less than what we've got in these machines here. So I think after talking to Brett, after talking to our customers, I think he is on the money with putting a small grain element into it. So we, like I said, we're going to do that and we're going to test it. Um, just one more thing on, the, on our concaves. I've worked with helical concaves before. Um, so as the bar is sitting, or as the um, concave bars are sitting like this, the helical concave is sitting like that. So our material coming into the machine is not hitting it on a 90 degree angle, it's hitting the normal concaves on a 45 degree angle. So with a helical concave, it's hitting it on a 90 degree, 90 degree angle. So that's more aggressive and that will give you the same effect as putting some of these rasp bars into it. Um, like I said, there's a lot of concave manufacturers that's pushing their product and saying, you'll cut your grain loss off. Um, I think if we do our rotor elements and we do the modifications here at the back, that will cut our problems with our um, concaves out. Righto, um, Brett said the same thing, threshing area, separation area. I'll give you a bit of history on this area at the back. We've done a lot of work on that. Um, I had a customer who said to me, he's put in these spaces that I've marked white. He's put the spaces in between the side of the header there and the, and the separator grate. And he thinks that he's getting less grain loss. So I jumped out there with our grain loss tray, um, put the spaces back in so like it is now, uh, done a few tests and then put the spaces in. So we're taking the separator grate away from the rotor. We caught a few tests on that and the grain loss was less. So I said, right, we're on the money. That was before we've opened up these separator grates. So I was sitting in a, in a machine and we were doing wheat and on the grain loss monitors of the old machine, you could split it between a left and a right. That's on the sieves at the back. So what we could see is the right hand side grain loss monitor was nothing. There was one bar in the grain loss monitor. The left hand side monitor, we had six or seven bars sitting there. So logic tells us, all right, we need to get more material onto the right hand side of the machine because it looks like the right hand side of the machine is not working. And I'm pretty sure, sure all of you guys would have heard at schools or the salesman would have told you that these machines need to be full to, to work to its full potential. Same with those ones, same with the New Holland. So looking at the grain loss monitor, I thought the right hand side is not getting enough grain on it. So that's when I went back. We took the grates out of the right hand side of the machine 
and we cut every second finger off of it, right? Because our rotor is spinning clockwise. So I've done that, and before I could fit these things, I went out to a machine that had 100 hours on it. So we pulled the top serve out. So the serves on the new machines are painted black. So we took the top serve out, and the right-hand side of the top serve was shiny, and the left-hand side of the top serve was still painted black. So we took the bottom serve out, Right-hand side of the bottom serve was shiny, left-hand side was black. And then the penny dropped and I thought, well, the right-hand side of the machine sitting in the cab, where there's no grain loss on the right-hand side sieve, the right-hand side of the sieve is getting loaded. That's why there's no paint on the sieves. The left-hand side of the machine is not getting loaded. That's why the paint is still on the, on the sieves. So I raced back and we started doing this. So we'll take the first separator grate out of, from the left-hand side We've cut every second finger out of it, and we've put it back in the machine. So we would do a drop tray, have a look at it with the old finger still in it. We'll do a drop tray, measure it, we'll change it to these ones, drop tray, measure it, change back. So we do it a few times, and every time that we put these fellas in, our grain loss was heaps less. So with the old, with the um, factory fingers in there, about 12 and a half grams of grain, that we would get through the drop tray. We put these ones in and we drop down to about two grams of, of grain. So we said, right, that is, that is the ticket. As the, as the material is going around the, the rotor, it's getting forced between the rotor cage and the rotor itself. Centrifugal forces are pulling those seeds out to the side. So when it gets to the other side, it's like a hose pipe that you open. So all the grain will just go on the right hand side of the sieves. And then it will get less and less and less coming towards the left. So the left hand side of the machine is not really working. So opening up those grates, we're loading it up. We're loading the left hand side up. So we get even sieve loading and our grain loss will disappear at the back. So what does our book tells us to do? Do a shutdown, have a look at the sieves and see whether you've got it evenly loaded on the sieves. So that's great, but you've got to make a decision whether you want even loading or whether you want a grain loss at the back. And I would rather pick um, grain in the tank before we throw it out at the back. So with these um, cover plates that we put onto our, onto our separator grates, what do we do there? If we keep in mind that the machine needs to be loaded, it needs to be full to work to its full potential. So as soon as we put a row of cover plates onto it, we take material away from the left-hand side. So we'll do a drop test at the back or we'll walk around to the back and we'll see the left-hand side is getting more grain loss. So what we will do, we'll put another row of cover plates on it. What we really do is we take the material away from the left-hand side, there's less material on there, there's more grain loss on there. So I've been to machines where there's three or four cover plates on the left-hand side to try to stop the grain loss on the left. But in fact, you are just making the grain loss worse by putting the cover plates in. So recommendation, cover plates, leave them in the corner of the shed, don't use them. And open it up like that, hit it hard here, and then leave it alone. As soon as it gets to our separation area, leave it alone, give it as much time as possible for it to fall through. Um, our adjustable front chaffer here at the front of the top sieve, um, I've done some tests, like normally when you go out and buy one, it won't be adjustable, it's fixed, but you can tick the box from the sales office to say you want an adjustable one. You can't adjust it from the cab, you need to get in here and adjust it. Uh, especially with small grain, uh, small seeds, canola, loosen, and then on light grain, if you adjust that top chaffer or the pre-chaffer just close a little bit, uh, it will give you less grain loss. So that's the three things that, I, that I've done a lot of work in. Our concaves, separation area, and our pre-chaffer. Now, over the last couple of days, people said to me, well, if John Deere wanted those things to be open, they would have cut it open themselves. You can buy those separator grades through John Deere. If you tick the box and say, I want a tough crop separator package, you will get those grades with much longer fingers. So with a longer finger, obviously you get more space through it. So it's about, the last time I checked, it's about 16 grand to replace that. 
It's much cheaper just to cut every single second finger out. Um, difference between the 50s, 60s, 70s and these machines on our separating grates is absolutely nothing at all. So these separator grates that's in here, it's exactly the same part number that's in the 50 series machine 22 years ago. So they haven't changed anything here, but our horsepower has gone from 350 horsepower to 630 horsepower. So the horsepower has gone up, but our separation area stayed the same. So, yep, you can buy it from John Deere, tough package, and yes, you can buy it from John Deere, the adjustable um, uh, chaffer. And that is it. I've seen great results with it. Um, this year we'll have a go at different concaves, and we'll put rotor elements in, and we'll see how we go. Hopefully I can come back next year saying, yes, it is right. And what you're saying is watch this space. Watch this space. Tell us also what you've been doing as well. Yep. Yeah. Guys, are you sit here you with a green machine. If you got any particular questions, it's a taxi. No, he's not available to drive your head at <laughs> Well, how the deal is setting them up. Like, when you're buying your head of wires and the road are already leveled and all that sort of stuff. And you need to discover it on your own. Over a million dollars worth of spend on that car and do something like that to it. Yep. Why not? Um, they do level the, the concaves. That's part of the pre delivery sheet. They do level that. And I've been promoting it over the last four years to do all this work here. So, yeah, there's no secret there. I've been promoting it and saying, this is what you need to do to stop your grain loss. So that is, that is the intent is to try and do that. Not everyone does it. Uh, similarly, when uh, Brett was talking earlier about making sure your concaves are parallel to your rotor, that should be, again, on your case, it should be standard mm. PD. Um, the important thing is that you know it. So any way around it, um, Cassie, you've got to make sure it's calibrated. The same when you go and do your losses and do the loss checks, you need to go and, and then calibrate the sensors. Would that be a fair comment? Yep, that's right, yep. We've had exactly what you said, um, whether it's over in the West or Queensland or wherever we go, people will say that, why, why isn't the dealership doing that? And why isn't the dealership here? listening to what we've got to say and but yeah I don't have an answer for that it's widely advertised what we've got and days like this so it's up to the dealership to come up and have a look we've got one for Cassie it's just on canola like cutting them out I haven't done one on new ones we've got those heavier yep. grades but yeah you get a lot more shaft on the sieves yeah you do so. you do um, we've done it on a 70 series machine where we've cut it out like this um, and in canola, we've seen that we shouldn't have done that because our top sieve is so much shorter on the 70 series machine. You can see it when the straw comes out the back, the, the left hand side is loaded up more on the ground. Um, so on these machines here, because the sieve is so much longer, it rattles itself out on the sieve, so you can't see anything at the back. So yes, you are getting more material on there, but the machine's going to handle it with a longer sieve. 70s, 50s, 60s, 70s, don't do it on them because it's too short. Yeah. If you're doing a lot of canola. Uh, any, anything, any anything. Anything, yep. The only thing that I would suggest on 50s, 60s and 70s is put your spaces in, but don't cut anything off. Um, a few years ago when I had the 780 here, that had the longer separator fingers in it but I also cut every second one off like this. Um, but that was the only time that I've done it, so I won't recommend cutting any of them off just yet before we do a bit of homework on it. It's what Brett said, just try it. Like, um, I think Brett and I, were in the same mindset. If we want to see something work better, we'll go in and try something. And yeah, I had a lot of failures on these things that I don't tell people about, but the, the ones that we succeed in, We've done a lot of work on our repeats because I think the repeat system on these machines are probably a little bit of a drawback because it's not on our class sixes and sevens, it goes back into the rotor, so it gets a good old smack back in the rotor. But with these ones here, it's just a handful of material that you throw against the plate. So we've tried to do some modifications there and see whether it works. And we've just done the repeats, we've smashed it up too much. So I said, all right, just leave those ones alone until we, we try something else.
But yeah, most of, most of our phone is for sitting on the repeats.